This is probably the most famous biology textbook out there. I think uh, many of you know that a cell, any cell is, is a membrane within which there's a bag of proteins and DNA and RNA and so on. We've been fascinated by cells ever since we realized that a cell is the most simple functional unit of life. So if we can understand a cell, we go on to understanding what life is all about. And this fascination is very old. It started when, when this device called the microscope was invented and people like Robert Hooke and Anton Leeuwenhoek and others took tissues and, and pieces of living material and stared at it through the microscope. So this, this beautiful picture here is from Robert Hooke's Micrographia where he took a bark or cork and stared at it under the microscope and found these beautiful hexagonal structures. So it reminded him of the honeycombs of bees as well as the little rooms that monks lived in. So he called them cells. That's how the name came about. And we know now all these common features about all cells, this membrane, this nucleus and so on. But cells, even from the same organism, can be very, very different. So you see these beautiful pictures here. These are cells from a mouse. These are fibroblasts, which are your uh, skin and muscle and so on. And this green thing you see here is, is, is from a neuron or a nerve cell. They have these common features, but they're different. This red thing is a stem cell. Now this cell, under certain conditions, differentiates and becomes a different type of cell, a glial cell in this case. So the same cell can change its identity. Now it's really same, same, but different. Um, how does the cell do that? This is a question of cell fate. How does the cell acquire identity? How does it become something else? So this is a major question in cell biology. Traditionally, this is how a cell biologist goes, appro goes about approaching it. You take some cells, you put it on a slide and stare at it with a microscope. This is a great way to study cells because uh, you're looking at it and trying to find out what, are, what goes into building a cell. But this is uh, what I call a top-down approach to cell biology. But if you think about it, there can be other ways to study a cell. And uh, this is what some of us are trying to do. This is what I call a bottom-up approach to cell biology. So all cells are made up of different molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, lipid, and so on, as well as proteins. And these are the building blocks of a cell. Now, traditionally, these things have been studied by biochemists who take cells, grind them up, isolate single molecules, and then study what they do. But can we study these in the context of a cell so that we can build a cell from bottom up? And so this is where we are trying to make biochemistry a question, uh, this question in biochemistry, a question of cell biology. I'd like to use an analogy now to explain what a cell does. Look at this dancer. I mean, he's holding this pose perfectly still. But whether you're this dancer or, you know, the karate kid, holding a pose absolutely still is the hardest thing you can do. This is really hard work. This is exactly what a cell does. It's really hard for a cell to be where it is. Because at any point of time, it's making energy, consuming energy, making building blocks. There's this constant cycle of creation and destruction. All these little molecules, these metabolites are being made, used and destroyed. So this is metabolic homeostasis. And the current state of a cell depends on the metabolic homeostasis at that time. If that changes, the fate of a cell itself might change. It might become something else, a specialized cell, a cell that does something else as opposed to what it was doing a few minutes ago. So what we are doing in what, what I like to term a bottom-up approach is try to identify and understand what are these metab metabolites that make up a cell. Now we don't want to just catalog all these different molecules, that's, uh, that's called stamp collecting. But uh, what we want to do is identify if are there some metabolites that are more important than others and if those change even a little bit, does the cell then commit to becoming something else? And then how does the cell know if that molecule is there or not? It has to have a way to sense them. So for that you have what are called molecular sensors, and molecular switches. When a metabolite changes, a molecular switch kicks into action and switches what happens to the cell itself. This is not just an esoteric, you know, obsession of an academic scientist, but it, it's really relevant. This beautiful picture here is an artist's illustration of a cancer cell. Now we all know that cancers, in, in cancer cells just keep growing, growing like crazy at the cost of all the other cells in the body. Eventually it kills you. But at the very core of a cancer, you have metabolic switches at play. So this molecule you have here, uh, even if you don't recognize it, you know it, it's glucose. 
this is a primary currency for energy in cells. Normally, cells use it slowly, make ATP as and when needed and so on and so forth. But in cancers, what happens is there is a switch. At this crossroad, instead of slowly making energy, there is a molecular switch that has gone out of control and therefore it uses glucose like crazy, keeps consuming, consuming it really rapidly at the cost of all the other cells. Eventually it goes on to kill you. So we in the lab are trying to understand what this kind of a molecular switch are, what are the molecular switches that cells have, how do they stop detecting metabolites the way they should be and if they don't do it right, what happens to the cell. But you know, studying something like cancer or any other metabolic disease can be very complicated. There's all kinds of differences in the cells and working with tissues and so on. So can we use a simple model which works with the same principles so that we can build these basic rules by which many different cells work. So we do that in our lab using what I call man's oldest friend which is uh, brewing yeast. Now brewing yeasts are remarkably versatile cells. We can manipulate them, do all kinds of things with them. There's also something uh, very interesting about them. Depending on the condition they are in, they can behave very differently. So under some conditions, when there is a lot of glucose, they can behave just like a cancer cell, take this crossroad and go this wrong way. Or under other conditions, they can behave like other cells that we have. And at the heart of this are different metabolites and molecular metabolic switches. And of course, there is something else that is rather nice about yeast. What they do in high glucose, uh, just like what cancer cells do, is make a, a molecule that we uh, like a lot, it happens to be ethanol, uh, cancer cells make something else but yeast make ethanol through exactly the same process. There is more now to cell biology in itself. Cells don't live in isolation, they live in large complex communities which means they have to communicate with each other within themselves and then the cells at the outside of a community might be perceiving the environment very differently from cells inside the community. How do they then communicate with each other and then what is happening at the heart of the cell? Are there different metabolites deep down in a community versus outside and so on and so forth. Now again, this is a complex question, but can we use a simple model, in this case yeast, to answer these kind of complex questions by building simple rules by which cells in a community can uh, communicate, cooperate, uh, go against each other and so on. This beautiful picture here is a colony of, of yeast cells. Now typically they are round, but when you starve these cells of protein, they start putting out these finger like projections. The thousands of millions of cells here, you can see the cells have changed as they are, go out outside of here, they go foraging. But all these cells are genetically identical. What's happened is there's been some kind of a metabolic change which is communicated across this community, and so they've changed. Can we now start understanding these kind of m metabolic switches using this model? Just like that, you can take otherwise a colony of yeast cells and observe them as they age, they grow older and then you see specialization, cells with different functions emerging even though genetically they are all identical. This is what we are trying to do in our lab in this bottom up approach to cell biology by trying to build basic principles of what are the molecules that make up a cell, how are they sensed, how, how do these switches work and if these switches go wrong, what happens to a cell and what happens to its identity. And this is the question we are trying to address because by doing this and by using these kind of approaches, we and others think we can bring a new perspective to what happens to a cell and understand how cells work. Thank you.